Okay, everyone, it's seven o'clock now, so we'll get started. Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Wheeler from Ethos. I'm just here to do the welcome and give a few little details before we pass over to Dr. Fairburn for the main presentation. Um, you, if you've been on our webinars before, you'll be used to this, but all of your microphones are muted. We have far too many people on the line to be able to have your microphones open. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button that should be in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll go through those at the end. And we will also record this webinar and we will send you through the link hopefully sometime tomorrow after we've processed the video. So if you need to leave or there's any section that you want to review and watch again, and um, you'll get the recording sent through then as well. That was everything from me. So I'm gonna pass you over now to Dr. Peter Fairburn to show you some of his more recent cases with Ethos. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, anyway, today should be um, a little bit of extra fun. So um, hopefully, hopefully we can all um, enjoy ourselves and, uh, and have a bit of a, you know, a bit of an evening um, and uh, just see what we're looking at and what we're doing more recently now. And, and a lot of this is still uh, just ideas I've been sharing with uh, Minas, with Minas. And, um, and so we, we're always been working together a little bit and uh, just looking at how we can push the area we're going and uh, further and but also other areas Mike Ainsworth this is a very much of a tribute to Mike and Mike's work as well but the most important thing is is this Sorry about that. I just needed to try and get is this um, the Queen's Award. And uh, luckily, in uh, two weeks ago, we were awarded the Queen's Award for Enterprise, which is the highest award you can get business wise in the UK. And so it's been quite an exciting time for us. And it's all our friends and our colleagues and our, our customers that have helped us achieve this. And, and so for me, it's quite an exciting time. And after 30 years, you know, I understand that things change. Essentially, it's for the better. And, and this is what we're going to do tonight is look at a few more of the recent changes in my cases, my protocols, and evaluate them. And yes, also celebrate the, the last 20 years of only using synthetics leading to this uh, esteemed award. I, I, there was a, on the ADR the other day, there was a, a debate and I showed a case and someone said, but this is not what you say. Well, you know, we all learn and we're all changing and we're adapting. And this is the exciting thing about implant dentistry, you know, in my 30 years of doing it, is that we're learning and understanding how to improve our outcomes for our patients and for ourselves. It's as simple as that. I'll start straight off with this extreme because I, I showed this uh, today. Uh, I posted another case on Ethos case studies. Um, and, and look, this is just when you get sort of desperate in a way. You've opened your implant, there's less bone than you realized, but you can with this material. Merely that's the size of the defect. Yes, it'd be nice to have a big maxi in here from Southern, but you can just place the implant into ethos. So you pack some ethos into the side, place the implant. I normally put the healing cap on already and take it out the car carrier like that. And then just graft extra ethos over it, suture close. Now, this is an important thing because I had my second failure in about 350, 360 cases the other day. And it was because the site wasn't closed. And I think it's really important when we're doing any push and work that you must get really good closure. So as you can see, I've got a drier mix of ethos on the outside and then sutured closed with PTFE here. And, and it's important to place the implants a little deeper in this situation. As you can see, when we look at the x-rays, that's the defect and the, the cyst, uh, ridiculous cyst below the apex of the roots. Take it out. I look, yes, we could have probably put a 10 in here in hindsight. That would have been better. But you can see I've placed the ethos into the site, cleaned the site, placed the ethos, pushed the implant in, and then this drier mix over the top. And here it is at six days afterwards, I think it was five, six days afterwards, 
and you can see we've got good healing. If you have any opening here, this can be a reason for failure. And uh, because it introduces bacteria into the site, I'm not saying it will be a reason for failure because it'll heal by secondary. But what we're trying to look at, at is over 99% success. Anything less in the UK is, is not acceptable as a treatment protocol. But this is not a protocol. I haven't published it yet. It's not peer reviewed. So it's important that we just look at it as what we, um, what we have and to try and understand this is a rescue thing if things start to go a little wrong. And I try to explain that in today's case uh, that I published on case studies. Anyway, here's a 10 weeks. Now we can see we've got new host bone over the top of the implant and the implants integrated at 10 weeks. Here is the new host bone at 10 weeks. You can see, it's, you know, it looks like bone, feels like bone. Well, it is bone because there's only 10, maybe 12% maximum of uh, residual graft material at this period. So we need a round bone to access the implant. There it is down there and we place a healing cap and restore it. And so here it is restored and it's adequate. Um, you know, uh, the patient's quite, quite a demanding patient. So, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we, we had to, oddly enough, bring this implant a little more lingually uh, because the patient said, although her upper, upper seven was, is massively buckle, so it became quite a difficult occlusion was, but patients don't understand occlusion. Um, that it doesn't come up on, on Google when it comes to implants. So here it is now loaded eight months, and you know you can see we've got a stable situation with stable hard tissue and stable soft tissues. So after seven years, a few hundred cases, what are my observations about the push-in? Well, look, treat this with caution. Uh, Mines had a failure about six months ago. And uh, again, it wasn't that there was closure. So we must get closure with it doing the situation, must play subcrestally. Does it work well otherwise? Yes. In my hands over the last seven years, I've had uh, less than half a percent uh, failure rate. So that seems to fit into my category that if it over 99, 99.5% success, then it's, it's reasonable. But I'm yet to publish it. So I, as I say, this is not something you plan to do, but it's something that can rescue in a situation. As regards planning and publications, you know, I have this publication, um, a 10 year study from published in uh, 2015. And that just follows our traditional protocol. What we're going to show tonight is a lot of kind of cases that are not the protocol, not the extraction, leave it for four weeks, load it at 10 to 12 weeks, that kind of thing, where well, I have six and a half thousand cases. So this is going to be looking at different ways of doing it. Um, you know, it's just this variation because we're learning new ways on how to a, reduce the amount of surgery and reduce the time and reduce the pain and discomfort to the patient, because these are really important things. We, we may not think so. We may think we're massive surgeons, heroes in our own underpants, but in actual fact, patients themselves are absolutely happy not to have foreign donor material and are happy to have less surgery than they normally would have. And this is an important aspect is to have reduce the amount of surgery. And this is why I'm doing a lot of these procedures uh, that you'll see tonight. First of all, I'll just show a quick case, which is old school, uh, just the standard protocol case, but with a twist. And uh, the twist is the interesting part, um, again, because it's like thinking different, thinking laterally. Um, and as you can see, we've got a very mobile tooth here. The guy's a barrister. Uh, he doesn't have medical negligence. He's a criminal barrister. So we can push the boat out a little bit. You can see we've got a fracture in the root. Once we remove the tooth, I just put this big burr in just to show the extent of the defect and how there's going to be very little uh, area to create attachment. But as I showed from the pushing cases, um, primary stability, unless you're loading, is of no importance, and nor has bone to implant contact, because the body will heal. If, you, if you're immediately loading, it's a critical factor. 
but without uh, immediate loading, it's fine. If you're leaving it there to heal, it'll heal. You know, this, this is often debated, but in actual fact, Tom Driscoll proved this in 1978 when he invented Bicon implants. There is no primary stability in Bicon implants. They drilled in and just tapped into a hole. And every Bicon implant since that era has, so way before we were talking about many other things. Um, so the notion that you absolutely need primary is, is, is completely flawed. Anyway, as you can see here, we've got a small buckle and that's where the palatal plate is as well. So we've lost a lot of the palatal bone, buckle bone. You can see the granulation tissue. You can see the effect on the soft tissue. What we're missing here is this keratinized tissue. I did make a mistake in this case, and here's my mistake. We all make mistakes. You know, most times I look at all my cases and I go, hmm, I could have done that. It would have been 5% better. I could have done that. But this is what we're always learning. And this is what tonight's all about is we are always learning. We never know. Um, you know, the older you get, the more you realize you don't know. So it's a, it's a classic situation. Anyway, here, what I'm doing is taking the granulation tissue, but not removing it, just keeping it to the palatal aspect. So it's attached still onto the palatal soft, uh, soft gingival tissue here. And then I clean the site. Now, this is a really important thing. Get your degranulation burrs, get whatever you like, your curettes. The site's got to look like this. It's got to be clean. Um, this just takes away that 5% where you may get failure, extra 5, 10%. Because, you know, the body heals despite what we do. So if we don't clean it fully, it'll probably heal. It doesn't matter. You know, leaving granulation tissue, as uh, Manuel Chanavez used to say years ago, the granulation tissue is the good stuff, you know. Yes, but what it does is it may introduce infection in a very small percentage of cases. So it's important that we rather clean the site to get that 99% success. That's what we need, and that's what we need in the UK. Here's the osteotomy. You can see if I'm going to get one thread in there, I'm lucky because I'm up against the sinus, um, and we just placed it in the optimal position for where we want the crown. I don't care about where the bone is because the host is going to regenerate the bone. It's a restorative uh, job. Mistakes? What did I do wrong here? Yes, I definitely made my flap design poorly here. I would have now extended it to this level about here and as well as on this tooth because this was going to cause a problem on the molar, as we'll see later. So as you can see, there's the osteotomy. We're doing one millimeter, one and a half millimeters. And so effectively, we're going to push this implant in. Uh, it's going to get a little bit of primary, but in actual fact, I ended up getting no primary to the point that I could hardly uh, remove the cover screw uh, driver without pulling the implant out. And here is the, the graft. You can see that's the extent of the graft all the way down, all the way there. That is in host bone, that last little noble of the implant. And when we place it, what we always do is graft the palatal side first with a slightly wetter mix, put the implant in. And if you look at this picture very closely, you can notice that I couldn't get the cover screw on because as I was putting the cover screw on, the whole implant was rotating. So it became quite a, a difficult case to do. Now I put the drier mix over the top. And now I'm taking this granulation tissue that was inside the socket placing it over the graft material to help the soft tissue healing. And so we're putting it to a, a good use. I've done a, a few hundred cases like this. Uh, again, I haven't published it, so it's just what I see. It's just my opinion. It's not uh, a fact that it can help with soft tissue healing. Here it is at 10 weeks. Now, what do we notice? Yes, we've got this issue here. But you've got to remember this crown is really old crown. And, and again, it's, it's a referred case. So I can't really say, oh, I could do something nice to that. Well, I can't because it's not my case. The other thing is the big gap between these teeth. He's using a toothpick in here. Again, so it's, it's not ideal. Anyway, I was a little disappointed when I was looking at the hard tissue as well. But you've got to remember, we only see what we can see on x-rays. So we're not seeing the next bone forming. 
we're not seeing the new bone because it's yet to calcify at 10 weeks or it is calcifying, but it's not as calcified as it could be. You get a completely different picture if you throw a whole lot of xenograft in there. But in actual fact, in reality, you're getting a lot less bone, but you're just taking a picture of a cow and you're saying, look at all the bone I've got. No, I prefer to really get the true picture of a regenerative and a host regenerative uh, picture. And this is why it is all about true, true bone regeneration. So I fitted a healing cap with just a small incision. And here it is a week later at taking the impression. Now, it's always good. I always check to make sure that it's indexed, these impressions. But there was a little bit of bone over the top stopping the, the fit. So I mean, I had to just remove that. And here is at fit. As you can see, we've got a reasonable outcome here. Yeah, yeah, it's a little disappointing this, but I think it's more to do with the crown uh, and a number of other asset aspects. And here it is now loaded. And you can see we're now getting more mineral, uh, mineralization of this area. And so we can see it more. We can only see what's mineralized. That's why the xenographs work so well, because they mineralized forever. They dead stuff that's going to stay there forever. So they look fantastic, but they're not the truth. The truth is what we see biologically. And the interesting thing is, yes, we've now got a nice new regenerative approach on this adjacent tooth with the PDL and everything looks good. You can see the size of the gap between these two crowns, the overhangs on the gap. But as I say, it's not my, my patient. There's nothing I can do about it. So there it is, looking at it from the beginning to restored and restored six months. And here it is restored two years. And again, you can see we've got nice tissue stability after two years. And you can see with the, the papilla nicely formed, nice uh, keratinized tissue. This is a real key is to having not just a keratinized tissue, but an attached keratinized tissue. And for attached keratinized tissue, we require host regenerated bone underneath. We do not require to have some foreign material. It doesn't necessarily attach to the side. So, you know, again, I very rarely uh, do free gingival grafts because I feel if I help regenerate the, the, the host tissue, um, the hard tissue, the body does the soft tissue. There's this is a new research paper out about connective tissue grafts and how it improves uh, the bone uh, by Ronnie Young. I mean, I think it's the other way around, which is logical, but as dentists, we don't look at logic some of the time. And here it is now scanned at 18 months loaded. And you can see we've got a nice, oops, sorry. We've got a nice uh, new buccal plate, new palatal plate. The, the hard tissue seems to be solid around. We look at it in cross sections palatal plate, that's probably where the defect was down to about that level. Buckle plate was down to about this level. So it, it seems reasonable and it's adequate. When we look at, uh, this is now just put on Castream software. Um, here's the palatal area and this is the buckle plate, which is adequate um, uh, at 18 months loaded. And, and this is the important thing is it's not about uh, putting something in there that gives me a good x-ray. I want to put something that, that turns to nothing. In other words, it's all gone, the, what I put in, because I want host bone. I want to look at this x-ray and say, yeah, this is the patient's healed well. I don't want to say, oh, look at my cow. It's going to be there forever. It looks lovely. So it, it is an important aspect to, to be realistic with ourselves and, and, and have a, a, a realistic uh, a viewpoint. So now looking at 2.0 PDS suture, you, you probably, if you follow case studies, you'll see I'm doing a lot of this at the moment. And uh, this was a referral case from another AnyRidge user and they wanted an AnyRidge. And as you can see, we've literally got the rugae of the palatal soft tissue uh, onto, the, onto the occlusal surface here. When we raise the flap, you can see I've extended this flap a little bit. I extend the flaps when I'm planning to regenerate bone against the adjacent teeth. If this bone on the adjacent teeth is fine, I don't, I lose papilla sparing as, as, uh, 
uh, is seen with Tarnow's research. So if you look at it here, that's where the level of the bone is. So yeah, we've got a, we've got a little issue, especially when you look at it on the inside. Now we've got this knife edge ridge. Can you see this, this knife edge here? So it was even a struggle to get this uh, guide into the position between the palatal area. And so we've got two cortical plates. Yes, I tried with Versa, but uh, there's no way you could do anything. So I decided what we're going to do here is the two PDS. You can see these two holes drilled by green stable lock burr. So we place into the one and into the other. We drill two holes with this green burr. Then I've grafted the palatal side, and then I'm going to place the implant into the osteotomy. Here, it's, uh, I think it's uh, 3.585 or 3.510. And then I get a short section of the suture, place one end in, bend it over, place the other end in. Then I, all I do is place the dryer mix. Now you can see there's two, three threads showing out, buckly here. And, um, you know, and you've got this knife edge ridge. So this is what we want to improve. Suture closed, I like using Coriflon uh, PTFE sutures, put some blue M gel over it just to improve the healing. And I've used an aura aid here. Now, aura aids, the patients like to just take them out, the bandage. So if you're going to hope to keep it there, you have to suture it in. And I didn't hear, so the patient probably took it out anyway. And here it is at 10, uh, 10 weeks. It's, it's an improvement. You can see now we've got better soft tissue, a wider ridge, slightly improvement vertical. But this is only the beginning of the story. But when we raise a flap here, I want to keep it minimal flap because I don't want to disturb the soft tissue. And I used a round bow to access the implant. That knife edge ridge is now a nice wide ridge. for. Uh, so we've managed to graft Buckley. <clears throat> and then I'm going to just place a stock um, healing cap. Now, whenever we're placing healing caps or taking abutments on and off, on and off, I often see these guys, you know, I don't do it because I don't work in a very, um, I can't charge a lot for the work I do. So if you're in a very expensive area and you can make three temporaries and take them on and off and put different healing caps and tissue culture and tissue and make your tissues nicer. Every time you're taking that thing on and off, you're introducing bacteria into the site. Now, it's really important that we either place Blue M or uh, uh, I sometimes use letter mix. It's important to keep control because this can be an issue by introducing bacteria into new bone sites, especially if you don't tighten it fully in this and then you've got bacterial growth in the site. And then people get a failure and they think, oh, what happened to me? Well you're trying to do too much and you made mistakes by not looking at biology and bacteria. So it's important we do that. As you can see, we've got a problem with sinuses, nasal and axillary sinuses here. So we haven't got much bone to work with. Here's the implant outside the bone, bony envelope as such that's grafted. This is at 10 weeks. Yes, there's more bone than there looks here. And that's the reason is we limited to what we can see by x-rays. We can't, when we look at it by raising the flap, I get a lot more bone, but when we, the x-rays are only going to show us what's heavily mineralized at this stage. And as you can see with this particular case, um, we've now got a much nicer a week later, and this is going to refer back to the referring dentist. Unfortunately, I, I didn't restore this, but that's what I do a lot of. I get other, other dentists ask me to do difficult cases or to just do a case they're not comfortable with, and uh, they restore it because that's important. Anyway, here's a few months later after being restored. Yes, we've got to have maturation of these tissues. And here it is eight months, 18 months loaded. Now you can see we've got maturation. You can see we've improved. We had a little more of this margin showing. There's less of the margin. But now we can see we've got this nice collar of keratinized, attached keratinized tissue. Here's the x-ray at 18 months. Now we've got the bone to where we want it. And this is an important thing for the long-term stability, especially as this is a canine. That's what it was at three months, 18 months. You can see the improvement with maturation. This is looking back at, at an angle and you can see we've got a nice keratinized amount of keratinized tissue and a stability with reasonable papillae. Uh, it's not the greatest case because 
If I was in America, I would do a soft tissue graft, a tunnel graft or something here to make it perfect. But, uh, you know, the patient's happy and uh, I'm happy the patient's happy. When we scan it, here it is scanned at 18 months. A lot of people say, yeah, well, you know, is there bone? Yes, there is bone here, but it's hard to really assess when we looking at because of the, the difficulty with uh, CBCT and solid and implants. And when we look at it, I put the, the, this level of the scan, I put it exactly at this level. And as you can see, we've got an adequate bone coverage on the palatal aspect, so nothing to worry about. Doing this technique, you can do this crossover style. Uh, you know, I've seen people putting them over the tops from here to here to try and get input vertical bone. So how do I think about this uh, two PDS suture that Mike introduced me to Mike Gaines with? Well, you know what, the more I do it, the better I'm actually, uh, the, the better the results I'm seeing. I, I think this is one of the most impressive tenting mechanisms I've used. Um, a, we don't have to go back and get them out because they bioabsorb. Um, and B, it, because of the fact, if you put a tenting screw, you'd have one high point, say here with the tenting screws. Here, we've got a much more flexible, much more wider approach to it. Um, for me, this is a, a revelationary, easy cost, uh, very low cost. Uh, if it costs you more than uh, one or two pounds, that's a lot for this, this, this technique. So it's, it's quite an interesting way of looking at, at things. So we can take it to slightly more extreme. And as you can see, we've got a small concavity here. Yeah, a lot of people would do a block or a cage or let's do something really extravagant. Let's show how good a surgeon I am. I, I'm, I'm not into that. I simply believe that the body wants to heal. And all I need to do is work with it. So I want to do less because why? Well, the patient doesn't want a lot. The patient doesn't want to pay a lot. You know, this guy's paid 2000 for his implant and graft. And, and, you know, and that's a lot of money for him. He's a young guy. It's a, it's a lot of money. He doesn't want to have 10 surgeries if he can have one. Why have 10? Why have five? Why do you connect to tissue graphs? Why do all of this? You don't need to do it. It's simple. Um, as long as you understand the biology of healing. So in this particular case, yes, I made a mistake again, and I should have taken this to probably this secondary papilla here because I need to restore the, the tissue here. The reason why is he was wearing a uh, Essex type temporary retainer and that was destroying this papilla. And, and I probably should have looked at it here and right at the beginning. Anyway, so I've just done the same old thing um, where I've just placed the implant with a few threads showing um, in, the, in the optimal position for restoration. I don't care about where the bone is. I care about where the tooth should be because we know that the host can regenerate the bone. We know that we can regenerate this to the profile it should be. We do this routinely. So we basically placed with the uh, screw holes, done the same thing with the two PDS, same thing with graft material, never over grafting, just as simple as that. And I don't do big flaps. So I released to about here. I don't do big releasing flaps for two reasons. B, uh, um, when we release them, if we do too much release, it creates a motion and a movement. And so that all the mat, all the freedom and all the, 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 every time they talk, they're pulling this area. Therefore, we may need a mattress suture, as Shukran would show. I prefer to do smaller flaps. So therefore, it, most of it is still attached and therefore it can't move. <clears throat> and the other fact, which is logic, which if you just explain to a kid, you would get it. Um, we don't want, to pull this flap all the way over here, bringing this mucosal tissue here, we want the flap to go the other way. So that in fact, we're moving this keratinized tissue more buckly. And, and that just, to me, is just logic. Again, if we weren't a dentist, we would see it, I think. So what I do is I often leave this gap here to heal by secondary intention. So then in fact, what I've done is I've moved keratinized tissue buckly, which is logical stops me having to do a second surgery. You know, again, again, this is all 
just the teaching that we receive in most of the times is 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 all dictated by stuff from the 80s and and the 90s i know i was around then i was being taught then i know what we were being taught whereas we need to actually look at things in a more uh, constructive way so here it is 10 weeks later and you can see we now have nice new buckle bone and some bone growing over the implant so i had to raise this flap again i think probably should have left this papilla around and, and, you know, we live and learn because, as you can see, that's not an ideal situation papilla-wise. <clears throat> but what we've done is we've taken it from this little concavity to this situation in 10 weeks. One surgery, no foreign material, no grafting from the palate, no grafting from wherever, no taking a bit of scrapings from his chin or wherever, wherever. You don't need all that. You just need the body is ability to heal blood, let it heal, and work with the periosteum. The periosteum is our miracle. It's as simple as that. So when I came to restore it, yeah, maybe I could have screw retained, but it was hit, you know, hit and miss. So we discussed it with the technician, and we decided to cement retain it. Not what I like, but there you go. And the important thing here is to get this emergence profile on this distal aspect because we want to get a lower contact so that we can follow the research of Tano to improve the uh, papilla because you can see what's happening here, boom, no papilla because of all the protocols I've said. Anyway, this is fitted, it's okay. In the meantime, he'd had a whole lot of other work done on all his teeth and he's been whitening like mad so he didn't come in which is sad because, as you'll see, when they want like mad, they eventually lose their enthusiasm after a few years. So this was before, this is fitted. Uh, it's a, a reasonable result, average uh, for cosmetic case. As I say, it's the guy's 23 or 24. Um, you know, he hasn't got money, so it's, it's just a cheap uh, cost-effective approach. And there it is loaded. Now, what we do notice as we're going through time is we're getting this papillary formation here. And I just saw him today. So you can see this is before you can see where the papilla is destroyed. We are getting a little bit coming back. And this was today. Um, look, it's not this papilla here, which is what I would like. Um, but because we've moved the contact point down to there, from there, it never will be. It might be you know, in my, in my best, it would be up to this level, which is, which is still adequate. And, you know, yeah, I could get a soft, I could get a drill, I could get a high speed hand speed and just take this little lump off of extra tissue. It would look better. But again, hey, this is not America. Or I could just use Facebook and take it, I mean, uh, Photoshop and take it away. But <clears throat> I like to show you what's going on because dentistry is all about, um, the things that are not working as well or, uh, or, or, or us learning. And uh, this is the important aspect. So here's the x-rays. And as you can see, the distance from there to the contact point, 3.16. Therefore, with time, this papilla will improve. Sometimes it takes a little longer. This guy has got shocking oral hygiene after all the ass. But he is a kid. He likes to go out, have a good time. And here it is 12 months loaded. And you can see we've got stable hard tissue. I've just sent him off for a scan, so we'll see the results of that in a week or so. <coughs> Sorry, a bit of a dry throat now. Anyway, here's a, a sister of a dentist, and uh, you know he was like, "Well, you know, I don't really want to do block grafts on her. We don't want to do this. We don't." Want... And I and I fully understand why do all of that, and and why pe put people through all of that unnecessary painful surgery if we can just look at how we can get their body to do it for us. This is the simplicity of what we're doing. You know, I know we, we used to do blocks. I used to do them in the 80s, and I mean, in the early 90s, and uh, they, they're great, they're great fun, but um, they're inherently just a dead block of something, which inherently in the longer term will not lead us to uh, the, the, the road where we're planning to get to. So uh, this was just a temporary bridge. The dentist himself wanted to do the canine crowns, which is understandable. So I'm just here to try and improve this ridge and improve this case. So as you can see, raise the flap as usual. I'm, I'm just now extending a little further because I want to try and regenerate a little bit here. 
And you can see we've got a reasonable ridge here, but once we put the 3.5 implant in, there's a couple of threads showing at the top. So yes, we're going to need to regenerate, but we're also going to need to regenerate to improve the, the hard tissue and hence the soft tissue. This is on the other side. You can see we've got the same issue, a couple of threads showing, you know, a reasonable amount of bone. Just checking that they're, they're in parallel. Um, yeah, this is old school. Uh, I'm a little old school in, in a lot of ways, uh, having done this for 30 years. And we're going to now use the 2.0 PDS suture. So you can see, drill the hole, drill the hole. And um, it would be nicer if we could get this a little lower, but it's very difficult. And I can assure you, I do these all the time. I'm, I, was, I had someone in the other day, came to watch me do a case, and I was really impressed. Uh, basically, uh, I, I uh, did it first time. And I just put one in and bend it over and put the other in. And that was about the first time I'd ever done that. He thought it was easy. So I guess when he goes back to his surgery, he's going to find it. It's not as easy as it looks. Anyway, so here again, not overgrafting, undergrafted, dry and mix, ethos on, opposite side, same thing. I don't want to grow bone outside the envelope. The envelope is from here to where the restorative bone. I don't want a big lump of bone here. You know, what's the point of that? Uh, I just want the bone to be cover this side. So two to three millimeters of bone over the implant. That's all I want. It's not a, you know, it's not a, a big exercise in creating a big lump in someone's mouth. It's a, it's about just creating what we need. Sutured with PTFE and blue M again. Here it is at 11 weeks, 10 weeks. I just made a small incision, put healing caps. You can see we've got a wider ridge, nicer keratinized tissue. You know, it's not a massive improvement, but, but it's all we need. I don't want to have a big lump of something here that's not human. I want the patient's own bone, own soft tissue, without having to do free gingival grafts or anything else, because I want the patient to have less surgery and to do more of the work for me. It's simple. Anyway, so this was before, so afterwards, yeah, it's nothing fantastic. It's just normal. Um, and here's before looking, can you see here where we've got this gingival, we've just got a little more keratinized tissue, nothing special, but just enough to keep us happy. And then I've just putting a screw retained three unit bridge, I mean, four unit bridge on here, getting ready for the crowns. A little bit of blanching, uh, you know, it just helps in this aesthetic zone to create the feeling that the, the teeth are coming out of the gums. So there was before, there was after, you know, uh, again, you know, nothing major, nothing fantastic. Um, when we look at it scan wise, here it is. So you can see we've got this two to three millimeters of new buckle bone on both sides. And, and this is important because this is what keeps the stability of the case. This is host regenerated bone. This is not just stick something in there and see what it looks like. And when we look at it through cross-section, you can see again, all we want is to follow this profile. In other words, to restore the profile. I don't want a big lump here or a big lump here. This can happen, as you can see in this seven-year case, which I did the same thing. You can see we've got little defects here on both these implants. And we're just grafting with ethos. Suture it closed seven years ago. This is seven years loaded. Now I do have a big lump. What's the point of that? It doesn't do anything. So I'm not sure. This is seven years later. And, and we've got this kind of lump on the, on the scan seven years later, which to me is not a success. It's, it, it's irregular. So, um, you know, we don't want to build outside the envelope. We want to build the envelope to maintain this, the, the crown stability. Right, partial extractions. Everyone loves partial extraction. I like them, but they just take me forever to do. And being an older guy, I, I'm slowly running out of time in my life. So, but, you know, it's, it's a very good technique. It's logical. It makes sense. It's just that I don't feel I really need it, but I like, you know, there you go, fashion's fashion, and I'm a follower of that. Um, so all we've done is we've made a, a section through the tooth. We take out the palatal section of the root. It's important to get the apex of the root out in my eyes, because that's where the pathology will be. Now, the real difficult thing here is to reduce the thickness 
of this socket shield without making it loose and without putting the implant all the way in this disc. And so we've got to have a gap between the implant and the socket shield and not put the implant somewhere here because it's a restorative job dentistry. It's not the surgery and everything is all just part and parcel. Essentially, our job is to get teeth in there. So this is the difficulty. And you can see I've taken down more, taken down more. And it's important to get it below the level of the bone. My advice is to get Howie's kit or to get one of the kits um, because they're good for a reason. It makes this job much easier. Then I've just placed ethos graft down the site and placed. Now you can see this is the initial. And here was when we're doing the, the initial osteotomy. And by the time I actually get to place the implant, you can see you can hardly see the root because I've taken it down so much. This is just doing a pickup at 11 weeks. And, you know, yes, it works, it works really well. Look at this. We've got a wonderful red chair preservation. Uh, and this is the restoration. I, I do like all my acidic cases now. I do prefer using coaxis, and we'll go through that quite a bit by Southern. Really good idea. It just gives you another new sort of thing that I'm using more and more of. And here it is restored. Yes, this guy's not, you know, he's an elderly patient. So I've created this sort of slightly root appearance. Uh, he hasn't got ideal teeth. There's perio. There's, you know, I mean, I've got my hygienist on him at the moment. But again, he's not my patient. So I, I can't really have complete control of these cases. So without using a socket shield, yes, <clears throat> I feel I get reasonable results. And again, you can see I'm taking the whole root out here. And just doing the osteotomy, placing the ethos into the site. So placing, especially on the buccal aspect, because we know this is where the very thin bone is. We've all seen all our scans and see how thin the bone is. And then I love the idea of coaxis, because it allows you to place the implant more in this direction, but bring the restorative and the screw back into position. So when you look at it in position, you can see the screws in a perfect position. There's the ethos, there's the coaxis implant. Thank you, Dale, great invention actually. And here I'm using a P with Cervico. And this is another thing we're gonna talk in a minute. And, um, and basically we're now gonna make up a, a temporary crown using a peak. And the Cervico allows us to get this perfect emergence profile. Can you see exactly here? Now I'm going to do a, a talk in a couple of weeks just on Cervico and Ethos, and I'll get Minash to come in and sit in with me. And he can really explain the ins and outs and the benefits of this uh, soft tissue maturation generation and how we've actually worked with it. But here it is, the site is um, now the temporary is fitted, screwed back on, and that's our placement. And here it is 10 weeks later. And as you can see, we've got nice stability. Yes, I would like to have removed this one, done another implant here, or at least dealt with this browning, uh, this blacking of the soft tissue. But anyway, the patient again is limited with funds. But you can see we've maintained this profile of the soft tissue. And that's a help due to possibly due to the cervico profile. And, and the ethos working together. So here it is at um, impression time. And as you can see, we've got a nice profile and a nice maintained profile. Here it is loaded now. And if we look at it now, this is nine months loaded, uh, you know, and it's adequate. You maybe lost a bit of papilla here, maybe not. You know, it's difficult because these some of these teeth are very heavy, were heavily rotated. But if we look at the x-ray, it's all looking stable and looking adequate. And here's doing the same thing, but using a flap because we know that the bone is always thin. So I've done the osteotomy. Now, a lot of people don't like doing flaps, but I do a lot of these papilla sparing, not heavily released flaps. And it, within a, a week, you can hardly see where the flap is uh, or, or where the scar tissue is. Yes, you'll have scar tissue on a microscopic level, probably for a long time as you know, soft tissue can turn over like uh, like hard tissue. So, but what we're gonna do is place the implant in the correct position for restorative. In other words, I'm not gonna place it here. I prefer to place it where I, I like it. And again, using uh, the, the this 12 degree coaxis by Southern implants. 
And again, you can see now we've got a very thin, so now we're going to have to graft this site because we could lose this bone because once we've taken the PDL blood supply away and the buckle raised a small flap, what we've done is we're denuding the blood supply to this bundle bone so we could lose this bone. So it's important we graft this site. Um, and again, I'm using Cervico to get an emergence profile and help me build up a temporary. But now I'm grafting Buckley over the over the side and again suture closed ptfe uh blue uh blue m gel and here's the case and the situation with the temporary here it is five days later and you can see it's already you know looking reasonable a couple of days more once we've taken the sutures out sometimes i take the sutures out at two days three days if you take the sutures out earlier it uh, it does help reducing the scarring and, and improving the healing. And here it is at 10 weeks. So you can see without having to do all the socket shield, we've got a reasonable outcome. You know, it's not great and uh, it will improve with time. And again, using Cervico, we have this nice emergence profile. So um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite decent um, result. And um, there it is before, as you can see, this was at three weeks ex post extraction. And here it is 10 weeks post, uh, I mean, yeah, post the surgery. So you can see we've got a reasonable return of the profile. So let's look at, at, at cervical on upper molars. And uh, again, the idea here is to actually reduce the amount of surgeries and improve the hard and soft tissue by using host healing, not using me doing 10 surgeries on the patient or doing anything that's heroic because the patient doesn't want that they don't care what i do they just want the end result and as you can see we've lost correct nice tissue we've lost hard hard tissue here buckle and uh, palatal so we're going to need to try and do it all in one go there's the bone loss raise the flap again extending the flap a little bit to the tooth next door and as you can see, once we've cleaned it out, yeah, you know, this is palatal root, buckle roots. We've all seen this trifurcation. And it's important I press the implant right into the trifurcation. This can be a little difficult. I use the degranulation burrs to smooth the top off. Very sharp burr to go in, measure it, place the implant to the correct level, which is one millimeter subcrestly, one to two millimeters for this time. So as you can see, this implant now is two millimeters subcrestly or it will be in the future when the hosts regenerate the, the hard tissue. And again, we can check that with the Cervico equipment. And again, I've now got a Cervico emergence. This is over the buccal area and the palatal area. And again, you select, I'll do this with Mines because it's really important. It takes a little bit of trying to understand it. But as you can see, we're just testing it uh, and fitting it just to see that it's right. Mustn't touch the adjacent teeth. This is also important that we get uh, into papillary regeneration in this site as well. And grafted with ethos, suture it closed. Can you see? It's as simple as that. And there it is on x-ray. So we've now regenerated. We've now packed it with ethos on these sites. And, and here it is 10 weeks later. You don't see the patient. You, know, you take the sutures out and, and that's it. Leave the patient. The body's doing all the healing for you. As you can see, we've now got a nice emergence profile and a nice keratinized tissue on the buccal aspect. So we've taken it from there to there, one surgery. Patients don't need uh, another injection. Patients don't need this. What's not to like? Patients like that. They haven't got any foreign material. I haven't had to go through a long consent about putting a, some animal or some other dead bloke in them. Um, you know, it's it, it just makes sense. And this is what is logical to me and therefore makes the patients happy as well because they see here it is nine months loaded great result no not really it's adequate it's fine you know um you know maybe we could have got more anatomy and maybe i could have done a, a ceramic uh you know it depends where do you want to go as i say i do medium range dentistry i don't do anything special and so the tissues are nice and stable. There's the hard tissues. That's where we want it. We want the implant two millimeters subcrestally. This is the design for any ridge. 
So there it is before and after one surgery, average dentistry, it's all good. Okay, dead suits. Now we can take this onto the lower. And this guy came in a couple of months back and uh, he, he, you know, he, he was very afraid of going to have surgery done. So again, what we want to do is only do one surgery on him and no donor sites and no foreign material. This is what he wants. He just wants me to fix, fix him and he wants it to be fixed easily. So you can see we've lost the keratinized tissue up to about here. This is all soft mucosal tissue. We've lost some vertical height here. We're going to restore that. We're going to try and thicken the tissue up on the adjacent teeth. And we're going to do this all in one surgery that's going to take me 20, 25 minutes because patients don't like long surgery. They, they don't mind slow dentistry when it's doing restorative work or matching colors or whatever. They want fast dentistry when it comes to when we're cutting them or doing things they may perceive as being painful. Here it is initially, as I say, we'll go through this with Minas. This is using the uh, motor, getting the right emergence profile, getting the right shape for the tooth. Um, as you can see now, when we've injected the site, can you see all the mucosal tissue and the lack of keratinized tissue? So again, we just do the osteotomy again in the right position. Uh, you know, I try and look at it and put it right between where these roots are so that I've got it into the position which is optimal for restoration. It's a restorative job. Placed it to two millimeters subcrestally. As you can see, it's two millimeters subcrestally. And then I'm going to just use two PDS. You can see, put it into the one hole, get this in, bend it over, put it into that hole. There it is there. And you've got this large. And then I've got this cervico emergence profile former. And so you can see by using these two things, this is helping hold the soft tissue away. This is helping hold the mucosal tissue away deeper down. And if we do that and we encourage the host to heal, that's all we need to do. I don't need to uh, do any other big surgery. I'm, you know, as I say, I'm not a good surgeon. So we've now putting a drier mix over the top and there it is, suture closed. That's all. Simple as that. And if we look at the x-ray, here it is here. You can see the emergence is helping hold the tissue out. And here it is a week later taking the sutures out. Uh, and you can see immediately what we've got is we've got an improved height of uh, keratinized tissue on the adjacent tooth. I think this will improve with time. And now I've got a nice keratinized level. So it looks kind of normal. In one surgery, it took me 25, 30 minutes to do you know, the patients are happy with that. Uh, you know, they, they don't care how, if I'm not a good surgeon, they just, they just want to get the results. So we've taken it from here to here. And again, this is just using logic and using host healing. Um, this is just a case Minas did. We'll go through it with you in the next lecture together. And as you can see, by just making the incision here, he moves the tissue over with ethos and cervica and that's the end result you get at 10 weeks and it makes it easier to restore. And you can see we've even improved the tissue in this area up against here. Can you see we thicken? And it's just all logic by allowing the host to do this for us. As to vertical in this area, you know, I, I often do vertical as I explained the other day, um, but I don't go for 10 millimeters vertical. I'm not Italian. Uh, I go for which is logical. And that's three to two, three, four maximum millimeters vertical. And yes, there you can achieve it every time because it's uh, that's all I, I do really. We've got now short implants. We don't need to lateralize nerves like we used to do in the 90s. And in the UK, I would find that you would be so open to a serious issue with any lateralization. So I'd be a little reluctant to do that myself. And here it is, two years loaded. And you can see we've got a nice flat platform, two years loaded. So we've got two, three millimeters. So without having massive expectations of getting 10 millimeters vertical, again, I just work into what I need and what the host needs and not trying to do too much, understanding that I'm just a human and, and, and uh, understanding how powerful the host is at healing. These are the important aspects. And if you look here, here it is loaded two years with nice keratinized tissue, nice seal, difficult tooth, low seven. You know, it's okay. Yeah, not the ideal looking tooth, but there you go. 
you know, it's, um, it's dentistry. So I'll move on to a small cyst that Minas did, and we're going to write this case up properly. So I'm not really showing it on Facebook. As you can see, this is a friend of mine, and uh, she had a small cyst growing. Um, and, you know, it was just a ridiculous cyst, I think. And uh, we got it looked at just to make sure there was nothing else. The adjacent tooth here was incredibly mobile, and, and we were debating whether to uh, extract the tooth or or to leave it. and uh, and I, you know, I think we like keeping teeth uh, in, 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 in the practice we work here. We don't look at life as terminal dentition, uh, unless it really is. We like to always look at your own tooth is always going to be better than an implant. This is simple. Again, this is just logic. It's what you would want done on yourself. That's the kind of thing I'm always trying to look at. And as you can see, we've got a small defect. Um, where the cyst was removed, and as you can see, we've lost the bone, and this tooth was flopping around, but I, I figured let's try and save it. Um, so we used three cc's of uh, ethos in here. Yes, we probably should have done a little more, but we, you can see we probably could have gone, but we got nice closure and it, and it healed. And then the patient had to go work abroad for a while, so we didn't see her, and only came back a year later. And when we open the flap, now I'm going to place, but now this tooth is mobile again, because you can see what's happened. The host has healed the bone. This is what it does. The host does it. I didn't do anything. I didn't see her. She was on working abroad. We did have an unusual little hole here, which was kind of strange that I've never seen before, but I just cleaned that site and, and we grafted it. So it's gone from there to there, which is an adequate outcome for this particular patient. And the interesting thing is this tooth, whoops, this tooth here going from grade three mobile, in fact, even more to now nice and stable. And, and as you can see, there's the, the site of the, D, the, the cyst. Here it is grafted one month. It looks like you're losing material. Well, you're not really, we should have grafted a little more, I agree. Because um, you can see we didn't really graft the site. Uh, maybe if we grafted a bit more, you know, hindsight's easy. Um, what you see at one month, two months, three months is not the picture because what you're seeing is there's a lot of collagen, there's new bone formation, but it's not mineralized bone. So it doesn't show up on the x-ray. And uh, here it is one year. Then, as you can see, degranulation, just to sort this little hole out a little bit and osteotomy. PDS again, just to help hold out the tissue, place the implant, graft it. And as you can see, there's the PDS, there's the graft, and we're just going to build it out. There it is there, not over grafting uh, again. And here it is, two years loaded now, this particular case. And as you can see, two years loaded, this is where that big cyst was. Um, we've got three to four millimeters buckle bone. And this is what's important for long-term stability of these cases is that we have bone. I know a lot of soft tissue guys, and I, and as I say, even Ronnie Young's new research is they, they, can fictitious, they keep on fixating over soft tissue. And I prefer to listen to uh, David Garber years and years ago that soft tissue is the issue, but bone sets the tone. So if we get the bone right, the soft tissue is just right naturally. We don't have to worry about all this soft tissue surgery. Anyway, here it is loaded two years. Yeah, you know, maybe, you know, we could improve the soft. Anyway, sinuses, I've got another five minutes. So uh, I'm just going to go into sinuses. Yeah, lateral windows. You always learn how to do them before you do the others. And what's important here is not the tissue in the sinus, because we know anything will help the bone regenerate in the sinus even nothing is proven to work really well. What's important is that this bit above the sinus, this bit that I've grafted here, this bit that four years later is proper bone and above, not this bit in the sinus because we don't care. In actual fact, 90% of the support of this implant is coming from this first five millimeters, uh, according to, what's his name from Spain, from Bilbao area. Anyway, so the reason why that bit's important is that keeps the papilla, that keeps the tissue, that is everything. What's going on in here is not important. 
everything works. And this is where this comes to when I look at this particular case where we socket graft, when I pulled these teeth out, there was only one millimeter of bone. In fact, I perforated, which was embarrassing. Uh, and so I just socket graft the case. Can you see once we, and let it heal. Here it is at 10 weeks. Now, what I have is this bone. So any bone in here is not that important. The important bone is this bone. And this is something, again, which we don't seem to entirely graft, uh, grasp, is that the bone here is more important than the bone in here in the sinus. Any, you know, that's irrelevant, really. So here it is here, 10 weeks, razor flap. Now, look what we have. We had big sockets here, perio teeth. We've now got nice new bone. So it allows me to choose what do I choose? Do I use DASC to enter with, or do I use Versa with my good friend here, Ziv? And, uh, you know, he does everything with Versa. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I've only been using them for about three years. So I'm still a, a sort of a beginner. And um, so sometimes if I've got a very difficult case, I go through with DASC because I know that I can reduce my tear rate by using DASC, using the hydraulic pressure. And then I use Versa once I'm actually through. Um, and actually, you can see uh, we're just going to be driving more ethos into the site because we're going to just raise it up a small amount. And um, there it is there, placing this Peltop implant. Place a little more graft just at this area to create a nicer platform here just for restorative reasons. You can see it driven a little bit into the sinus. There it is at loading. So we've taken it from there. That's the socket graft to here. And um, here it is loaded two years, which is an adequate result. Final case, just looking at this tunnel. Um, now, this is just my receptionist, so I get to see her all the time. And as you can see, just using a normal uh, Busa elevator, just put a little bit in. You don't have to put a lot. That's all we're putting in. Half a cc is more than enough. Um, we're just trying to improve this area. I missed, I lost the photographs, made a little incision, put an implant and a little more. This is another 10 weeks later. So there's two sections of 10 weeks and you can see the improvement in the keratinized tissue, 75 on Ostel, what's not to like. This is the only thing I have at placement and this was the x-ray. And as you can see, it wasn't ideal. This is at 10 weeks, place this implant, a little more graft. Here it is at two years. And now you can see we've got a stable, bony environment. And we can see this by looking at what we can see in the mouth is now if we compare it to before to after, it's not necessarily this nice crack, nice color. What is interesting is this area here compared to that area there. So we know we have grown buckle bone out. Case is loaded now five years. Um, so it's an adequate result. What do I feel about tunnel grafting? Well, I, th I, I think there's a great future, uh, but tunnel grafting is harder than most people think uh, in, in a lot of ways, because it always is a two-stage procedure, um, uh, a graft at tunnel and a graft at placement. And uh, I don't know, you know, we prefer to put blocks in there. So, uh, you know, I think she had a block on the other side and uh, she vowed never to have it again. So this is why we, we did a, a tunnel on that. So the main thing about today, yes, I'm doing things a little differently, um, and uh, the and, and that's what that's what's what's nice. I've been doing this job for thirty years, and uh, we're always learning. And uh, it's for the sake of our patients and ourselves. If we can do something that's easier, more predictable, and uh, and the patients are happier, it puts less stress on us and this is a really important factor it's the take home message keep it simple and uh, your life will be you know a little easier that's all i can say right thanks a lot everyone for watching tonight and and thank you all our, our, our clients and everyone who's been involved with the success story of ethos all the staff at ethos um it it it, it really is a, a big thing for us to win this Queen's Award. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll hand you back to Peter now. Sure, we've got a few questions coming, Peter. So we'll run through those if that's okay. Um, I'd encourage everyone to, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom option. That's the way we'll be picking up the questions. So 
We had a few questions during the event about the suture technique. I think we answered those in the chat, but I would encourage anyone who's interested in that technique to have a look on the Ethos website on the On Demand Training Academy videos, because there's a video from Dr. Mike Ainsworth there that's really, really good. So the first question for you, Peter, um, xenografts can, oh, this was a question about the suture technique. Um, xenografts can fill many of these defects without the need for the suture material to support it. What happens to the ethos graft if suture support is not utilized? Does it collapse? No, not necessarily. I never used to use it before and I got adequate results. Um, it, it, look, it really depends what you want to do. If you want to get a good x-ray and fill a hole up, uh, without having any human bone, then use a xenograft. It's logical. Uh, I'm not saying xenografts are wrong. I mean, lots of people have used them for a lot, a lot of time, but the reason they're not used at all in medicine is they don't create bone. And uh, the problem really with bone is it's living tissue and just placing dead stuff in there may impede it turning over. Um, again, I'm using logic and, and, and high impact medical research. I'm not using dental research. So, uh, again, I may not know, um, but that's that's just the way I see it. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, another question: What do you think about using endogain in combination with ethos? Uh, I never have, but I I know some people who had to malphagy. He loves endogain. A lot of people see the benefits. It, there probably are some benefits. Uh, you know, a lot of these things like you know PRF. I don't don't use because I, I don't really need it. Um, I'm sure it works very well in, in hands of a lot of people doing other things, but I'm looking more at a true regenerative approach. And, uh, and therefore, I, 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 all I'm really dependent on is the body's healing capacity. That's all the periosteum and, and the ability of the body to heal. And uh, yeah, I'm only, you know, we, we're only learning and we're learning new techniques, but I think we're seeing exciting things. And um, I think as we get better and we learn more, I think we'll, we'll, we'll get better. Look, there are easier ways to doing things. If you want to fill the hole, as I always said, Pete, you throw a whole lot of bricks in the hole, the hole's filled. But I feel that we must lead ourselves into looking at something and measuring it with a set of calipers without using histology. Unless you're using histology and histomorphometry, you cannot judge success. Success is, is, is far more complex. We're scientists. We're not, um, you know, we're not carpenters. Well, we've had a few more questions come in, Peter, so we'll try to get through them now. If you yeah, sure. minutes to go now. Um, you mentioned placing the implants one millimeter subcrestal, but what guidelines do you use when there is deficient alveolar plates on both sides, on both alveolar plates? Uh, do you use the CEJ as a guideline? Yeah, I just imagine where it would be one millimeter subcrystal. I look at maybe adjacent bone. Uh, you know, you can look at CEJs, but a lot of these patients are, are, are not the ideal patients because a lot of them have had bone loss or perio or whatever. So, uh, you know, the cement enamel, yeah, I, I, I use, just look at it, eyeball it and go from them. Um, you know, and, and try and assess where I feel would be one to two millimeters subcrestal. Yeah. Cool. Good. I'm just uh, I'm reading the questions as they come through now. Yeah, sure. So um, the doctor here commenting that he's tried using ethos, but has found it usually gets a bit too wet when he's using yeah. it clinically. And um, do you dry it simply with a sterilized gauze or are there? Yeah, any yeah. I've, I've, look, I've had cases which, as I'm about to suture up, they suddenly stop bleeding like crazy. I don't know what's happened. I just get my nurse to hold a gauze on it for five, six, seven, even 10 minutes, and, and the bleeding will cease, and then I can suture it close. Um, you know, you don't have to sort of worry about the, the wetness as much. A lot of this is because we 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 having to actually do more complicated work. In other words, uh, it it's much easier just to put a block there because anyone can cut a block and screw a block on. Uh, but the block's dead, so it doesn't make biologic sense. So we're just looking and working it biologically, and and you just develop a different set of skills. Look, as I said a number of times, I'm not a good dentist. I I just do the same thing every day a couple of times a day. I, you know, I don't charge a lot. I'm not the best. I mean, there's lots, you know, uh, you know, so it's just important to really understand 
how good the body is at healing and it just adapt the way you work slowly. Yeah, you know, you don't try something once and, and say, oh, well, it didn't work. You know, if that, if that was the way, then no one would have ever climbed Everest because it's not easy to do. So, but you don't have to be good to do it. That's all I'm saying. I just say you just need average skills and you can do exactly what I do. You just need to understand and practice. That's all. Um, next question. Is there no need to mix ethos with harvested bone scrapings? And is there no need to perforate the buckle plate? No, I, I, I've i never done either of those. Some people say that, some people I respect say you should perforate the lowers. Uh, and as I used to say, Pete, I would have done that on my mother-in-law, but we won't bring her into this. Um, um, as for, for scrapings, no, I don't use scrapings for, for two reasons. People may say, oh, it's because of the bone you put in there. Uh, it's not, it's all in the blood. Uh, it's the periosteum in the blood. This is what regenerates bone. Uh, I don't think there's that much in the dead scrapings, but you can use them if you want to. That's fine. Uh, you know, I, I, I never do. In fact, my nurse scra scrapes them all away. And in fact, uh, Megagen burrs are incredible bone collectors, but I just throw it all in the bin, really. It's dead in my eyes. So two questions now that are very similar. So I think we can group them together yeah. and ask them together. Um, is it best to stay away from membranes always in every case? And the second question, it seems you're not using a membrane to cover the bone. What makes the epithelial cells not invade your graft and shift it to yeah. granulation tissue? Uh, this is a long story um, because there's no research to show that the soft tissue grows in. Um, uh, and so... I just look at the research and so if there's no research why am i using a membrane um uh, the the ideas of membranes uh, came around with guided tissue and guided bone regeneration late 80s early 90s by krista darlin and effectively i feel they were using materials which were xenografts um and the problem really was a, a foreign body giant uh, host giant cell reaction and this is encapsulation, even Danny Booster will, will point that out. He did a lecture recently, which was really interesting uh, uh, on, on giant cell reactions to graft material. And, and I think this probably caused the granulation, poor, uh, poor cleaning. There's a number of factors and finally motion. So you've got to have stability of the graft. A lot of grafts are not stable. And this is an important aspect. I look at free and pull. And this is why the PDS suture technique is good, because I think it further stabilizes the graft side. Um, uh, you know, there is a barrier function effectively in ethos by having the calcium sulfate there for three to four weeks. That's all the calcium sulfate lasts for. And the benefits of this, when you look at the high impact research, the medical research, you see that by these biphasic nature of the materials, by absorbing in three to four weeks, it creates further spaces for neovascular ingrowth. And this is what leads to the high percentage of uh, new bone at such a, at, at these shorter periods. And, and this is why everything I'm sort of doing is just essentially what people do in orthopedics, that's all. The questions are jumping around the subjects a little bit here, Peter. Yeah. Um, I find mixing 0.5 cc quite straightforward. However, I struggle slightly with the one cc. Have you got any tips to mix it in the yeah. crowd? Whenever I mix one cc, I normally take half out, put it in a dappen dish because I'm always doing a, a big thing. So I do it in two phases. I probably use, you know, you know, Pete, probably 90% of what I do is 0.5. In actual fact, we're going to have a 0.25. Uh, and, and this is the whole concept, is I tend to use less graft uh, unless we've got a, a really big cyst site, yeah. Yeah. Um, a question about the cervical cases in particular. Which material do you use to customise the abutments? Uh, just a flowable composite and then just polish it. I mean, I, 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 I will get, you know, when we because we've got a, a, a webinar arranged on that, Pete. And, and I'll get Manas to just explain in, in one case. Uh, otherwise, it's it's quite hard to really understand. I had Inus and, and, you know, it was difficult. Anyway, what's the next question, Pete? We'll There's get two Manas. questions left now, so we're almost there. Because I'm running out of battery. <laughs> <laughs> Any tips for tissue level implants with ethos? Uh, yeah, everything I generally used to place was all tissue level. It's just more recently I've been using more Megagen and going sub and uh, all the southerns I place or tissue or maybe half a millimeter. That's all. Uh, so just treat it as normal. Yeah, they're just different level. 
I would add there is a webinar from Andrew Fish on our website, particularly yeah. looking at combining ethos with tissue level implants as well. Um, the last question then, can ethos be used to graft the pontic site or will the new bone resolve if it's not loaded? Um, it probably won't, but we don't have evidence. So often in pontic sites, I add a little bit of synthetic HA in it and I've, I'll post a case on case studies where I've got a scan uh, to your follow-up. So, you know, um, you know, you, you don't need to, but in actual fact, it, it has worked very well in this case, yeah. And so I normally add some uh, add bone uh, BCP or something like that, which is also from uh, uh, from the same factory at Medbone. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that's all the questions. All right. Sorry, Peter. Lots of questions today. Yeah. Thanks, and it's great to great to see you. Great to see everyone. And uh, yeah, I know we do things a little differently, but as as I say, these are just conceptual ideas which I've picked up from medicine. And so it's just an, it, it's just a different way. Everything works in the right person's hands and everything we do in dentistry and all materials all work very well. It's just about adapting and learning the skills to your direction and to try and understand. Thanks a lot, P. Thank you very much, everyone. Right. Uh, have a good evening or a good day, depending on where you are in the world. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye bye then.